Hi everyone and welcome to Green Monk TV. My guest on the show today is John Soyring from IBM. John, uh, you are part of the IBM Software Group. Yes. Uh, and we're at the Connect09 conference today and we're talking a lot about the Smarter Planet initiative from IBM. Yes. So IBM has traditionally been known as Big Blue. Are you guys now going to rebrand as Big Green? Well, this, certainly some have referred to that, but blue is important too because of the color of that water appears to many people as well, and right. water is part of our projects. The, the blue marble. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about some of the stuff you're doing uh, around water, for instance, uh, seeing as we brought that up. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So we had selected water because we, we know that there's already a shortage globally of the amount of potable water available to people, and, and the lack of potable water is a major cause of health problems in, in parts of the world and, and has adverse impacts on economy. So right now it's, it's a problem already, a pretty severe problem. Secondly, as you look at supply and demand, the, the amount of fresh water on the face of the earth or drinkable water, or that water that's easily purified to be drinkable, is finite in nature. It hasn't changed over centuries, um, really in the total amount, you know, very significant amount. Yet the demand with population growth and with the growth of, of certain economies around the world where more and more people are demanding the water not only for their own personal use but also for commercial use, mm -hmm. um, there's a increased stress on the system. So we look at it from a macroeconomic standpoint and say, there's got to be something we could do to help here. Yeah. So this team got together and say, how could we apply technology to help out the world of water, whether it's managing water resources or helping people to better um, distribute the water or very importantly, how make more intelligent decisions on how we consume water. Sure. So if I use one example as representative, and I, I won't give out their specific numbers because they shared them in um, confidence with me of, of what they were doing, but as an example, in the country of Malta, we were very fortunate to work with them because of the, the work they were already doing and recognizing that water is extremely important to the people, the citizens of Malta and the visitors, but very importantly, as they grow, continue to grow their economy, an increased availability of water is going to be critical to that. Their water, what they told me, 100% of the water comes from rain catchments. That's about 55-60% of the total supply. And about 40% or 50%, it varies I, I believe during the year, is seawater from the Mediterranean Sea that's desalinated, purified, and then distributed. Now, is I, I had the benefit of coming and visiting some of their desalination centers and purification centers, and they're already using you know state-of-the-art technology. You know, in the future, will there be better technology with nanotechnology and other on filtration systems? Very likely. So it's great to be able to work with some people who are already on the leading edge and pushing the the technology to its boundaries. The second is, you know, how can you distribute that water? Because today, water in almost all cities and regions of the world or countries in the world is heavily subsidized by taxpayers. Sure. Consumers don't really realize the true cost of the water because no, well, the water, price water is free. It is, you just yeah, most the people, and there it is. Yeah, it, it's so, so inexpensive, the monthly bill, that people perceive it to be free. But in reality, the cost is much higher than what they're being charged. And with um, governments, city, regional, federal governments around the world being stressed and the, because there's a gap between the taxes they collect and the amount that they're spending, um, it's not a sustainable economic model. So eventually, water will have more and more market prices. And, and for decades now, I've been projecting personally, um, this is my own personal opinion, that the price of a barrel of water will far exceed the price of a barrel of oil. And what's important is we can live without a barrel of oil. We've got alternatives to oil. It's, it's going to take a while to develop those, but we don't really have alternatives to, to water that we have to drink and survive, whether it's you know animals or, or human beings yeah. um, in that, that category. Because I, I saw a statistic recently that it takes <clears throat> 16,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of beef. It is expensive. And you know, the other thing that I found recently, and um, it takes quite a few liters of water to produce one liter of beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's frightening. So, <laughs> and I, I give up the beef. I won't give up the beer. And, and I, I happened <laughs> to be a, a real big fan of one of your Irish beverages. <laughs> Guinness? This Guinness is just absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, Think about this, and Malta is, is pretty representative of many other countries. We create this purified, drinkable water it, very expensively on a per liter basis. We distribute it. Our water systems are very old, many times measured in centuries, not just decades. 
there's leaks in the system. So there's loss of water in the distribution system, loss of water when they get into the buildings, the residential homes or commercial buildings. Loss in the buildings is pretty bad also from a health standpoint because it creates mold, which has an adverse effect on the, the living beings that are in that home yeah. or the, that commercial building. But very importantly, when you think about, we designed our plumbing systems that assume, as you point out, water's free. So we use it for all sorts. And I was shocked as I've talked to the CEOs of different water utility companies around the world at the very high percentage of the water that's just flushed down the toilet, a very significant part. And then when you look at the majority of it's actually going for irrigation for, for the grass that's in lawns or for the flower beds, for vegetable gardens, for trees, for irrigation for, for farms. Um, it's a very high percentage. None of it really needs the quality of potable water that we have. So there's a disconnect there between the amount that's flushed down the toilet and what could be used right. for irrigation purposes. And you know, the interesting thing is I'm, I was in Malta meeting with some of the government leaders and the business leaders in Malta, and on my, on my flight back to the United States, the airline had copies of the Financial Times, and I was reading through a section, and it was a Middle East country, I believe it was Qatar back in about April, had a paid section that they put in and talked about the different parts of the government, one of which is water management. And I thought it was just absolutely visionary what they're doing because the leaders um, in Qatar were setting goals for the future. They wanted to be able, every time they create a liter of, of drinkable water, they want to be able to use that liter seven times before they dispose of it. Wow. Now, so that's a great vision. Now the question is, from our systems today that use the water once in 95 plus percent of the cases, how can we get to a case where you know we satisfy a vision like Qatar has of using it seven times? Yeah. Well, and certainly a new plumbing system would do. But another thing is, if we had the intelligence sensors of where the water was being used, then we can make people aware of what their consumption habits are. And we've certainly seen that in hybrid vehicles, that when they know what their um, petrol consumption is, they try to optimize that and, and change behavior. Now if we can make that information available to the consuming public, and also, if they know what the real cost of water is yeah. and, and the benefits, we think we can um, precipitate some of that change. So that's what we're doing and for the smart water grid in Malta. Um, we've signed several other deals and just issued press releases earlier this week. One for the Lower Colorado River Authority, which is a watershed in, in Texas, supplying water to uh, central Texas. Um, one is in Japan with a water utility. One is in Australia. And, and then there's a variety of other projects, anywhere from working on the Hudson River in New York, which has in its you know, 1960s and 1970s, unfortunately, became very polluted, sure. um, to be able to place sensors through the river to identify when various chemicals, whether it's agricultural runoff, industrial chemicals, um, personal use chemicals, because people are you know, using medications, but they eventually flow out of your body, usually um, get flushed down the toilet, but they end up not being separated during the water purification process for sewage and when they do the sewage processing so it makes it in the river. So if we put sensors in the river we can identify the source and start to mitigate the, the pollution problem by hitting it at the source as soon as possible. Superb. Superb. Um, and you, you do, you're doing, doing a project in Galway Bay in Ireland as well. Yeah, absolutely. And as you know, being Irish, the, the bay in Galway is, a, is a, probably the major source of economic growth for, for the city of Galway and the surrounding region, whether it's the fisheries, which depend on the quality of the water, um, you know, they have better catches if the, the water quality is better, to um, Galway is a, one of the major import export centers of ports in Ireland, so the commerce of the country of Ireland is very dependent upon the success of it. Um, vacationers, people like to bathe in Galway Bay. So by putting sensors throughout on buoys throughout the bay, we're able to capture information and help Ireland be the first country to start satisfying a European, European regulation where this data has to be captured and made available to the public immediately so they can make decisions. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we measure is E. coli concentrations. Right. If the concentration level is below what the health department determines is acceptable or the EPA in Ireland, they say bathers, feel free to go in. Now people can make that decision rather, rather than waiting for a notice and perhaps missing it in the newspaper, going swimming and then ending up with some health problems. John, that's been great. Thanks for coming. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for coming here to this event.